Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Last two weeks we've been talking, or last three weeks I've probably been talking about the ABCs of faith. And um, we're, gonna, we're going to tie into that, or segue into that here at the end. And, um, you know, we've discussed the ABCs of faith. Uh, it's given us a good understanding of how faith comes and the basic structure of its function. However, we want to be able to move that faith from what I would call potential faith, in other words, you have faith, to powerful or applicable faith. In other words, you're actually using it. Remember when Paul was preaching and uh, the, uh, the Bible says the man was sitting there and he was impotent in his feet. And the Bible says, and Paul perceiving he had faith to be healed. Why wasn't he healed? If all you need is faith, why wasn't he healed? Because he had not taken what was potential faith or the faith to be healed to actually activating or using it. Paul told the man who was impotent from his mother's womb or in the impotent in his feet, the Bible says he perceived he had faith to be healed, yet he wasn't healed. How many times have we been in a place where we had the faith to get something done, but we didn't get it done. Why? Because then Paul said, stand upright on thy feet, and he received strength up, and he leaped up and began to walk. What happened? He acted on what was potential faith. It was faith that was available, faith that he had received, faith that was resident in him to act on, but he didn't release it yet. When Paul said, stand upright on your feet, he released it, and then he got the answer. Okay? And so, uh, some of y'all are old enough to remember Oral Roberts on television. And everybody, you see, they got mad at Brother Roberts. Because he would say, stretch your hand out to the television and put it on mine. Because he put his hand out to the camera like this. And people got mad. They got furious. Ah, oh, he ain't no power. That they, did, they didn't get it. They did not understand what Brother Roberts understood was that by having them come to that television set and touch it, they took their potential faith and turned them into powerful faith because they had a point of contact to release it. That's what he understood. It was the point of contact to release their faith that he was getting them to do. So he had them doing that to have a point of contact to release their faith. And I think we, with some, some in the past 10 or 15 years, we've kind of lost that in teaching faith. People no longer are, are, are identifying with having a point of contact. So just like Brother Robinson had them reach out and touch the television set, there's no power in that television set. He's, it wasn't his hand coming through their house and stuff, but he knew if he could get them to release their faith, then their faith would go from having the faith to get it done to having faith that got it done. And that's what we need to do in, 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 in our walk with the Lord. We need to release our faith. We need to have a, a point of contact where we can let our faith go. Okay? And so, um, hallelujah. Look at Romans 10, verse 8, 9, and 10. What, what is it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth with unto, unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto uh, salvation. Um, the Greek word here is rhema, not just confessing the written word, but the confessing of a revealed word. Now, in other words, faith is there. We have faith there. We believe it. And so there's also a variant reading. This is the Vatican. That's from the 4th century that reads, verse 9 this way, that if you'll confess the rhema with thy mouth, that Jesus is Lord. Now, here's the thing. The number one way, not the only way, but the number one way to release your faith is to say it. Okay? Some, now, now listen, saying it and not tithing doesn't get you prosperity. Okay? Saying, I believe I receive my prosperity, but then not doing what the Bible says of, of planting the seed, it won't work. Okay? So I said the number one way to release your faith is to say it. But then there's other, sometimes there's other actions you need to take. Uh, particularly in the arena of giving, you've got to, you know, you've got to, uh, you've got to give if you're going to give. Because the Bible, what? The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Confessing it and then not acting on the other part won't work. 
Okay, um, but the but the number one way is to is to confess to release our faith through our words. In that case, of the man who was impotent in his feet, you know, stand up right on that feet. He had to act on that. Saying it wasn't good enough in that particular case. He had that, it was another action required. That's why I say the number one way, not the only way, but the number one way to release your faith is to say it. Um, when we've majored so much on that that a lot of times people aren't doing the other things, they're just saying it. Well, I got my right confession. Yeah, but sometimes there's other things you've got to do in line with that confession. Or because you believe it and because you're saying it, you should be acting certain ways. You know, there's a lot of people running around, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. You know, there's no condemnation to me who's in Christ Jesus. You know, they're doing all these things, but they're not acting certain ways. And their heart condemns them and they're trying to confess that there's no condemnation. Honey, if you're out stealing, robbing, fornicating, committing adultery, and all that kind of stuff, and then you're going to come back and confess you're righteous, and there's no condemnation, you're going to be condemned. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what skinny jeans bedhead preacher says. Mm -hmm. Okay? That you know, uh, you, you know you're not under grace if, you, if you're condemned. No, 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 no. Your heart will condemn you. John said, if my heart condemns me not, I have confidence toward God. My heart. Okay? <laughs> so, there are actions that correspond with our confession, but the number one way is to say it. It starts with saying in many cases, okay, or in most cases, praise the Lord. Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24, we, you, you can't teach faith and you can't teach it uh, hardly ever without say, using this verse. Dad Hagen, every time we came together for Faith Library, said, turn to Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24. Now, he'd go all over the world with it. He would, he, would, he would start telling you a story and then drop down and then that tell another story and then drop down that and tell another story, drop down that and tell another story and drop down there and then class will be over. And you're down here about the fourth level down in the middle of the fourth story out of the first story. And he'd come back to the next class and that was two days later. He always had a day in between with his classes. Um, and he'd he pick up where he left off down here. And then he'd start working his way back up with the story. And he'd get back up to the original story and say, See, you, th you th thought I forgot where I was, didn't you? <laughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> Glory to God. But, um, you know, he, he would teach Mark 11, 23, 24, 22, 23, and 4, every time we got together. We'd have all kinds of directions he would go with it. Uh, so it's hard to teach faith without going there. Okay, because the principle of faith is in there. But Jesus said, have faith in God, or have the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt where in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he says, or saith, shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he Amen. saith. Whosoever gets whatsoever if they believe it and say it. Okay? <clears throat> so the, the number one principle of faith is you've got to say what you believe. Okay? There may be other required action. You start confessing, I prosper, that my needs are met. God supplies my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's the first step to that working, but you've got to add the tithing and the giving to it. I just believe I can say and get it. Well, just go ahead, stupid. Get back to me later and tell me how that works out for you. Right. Hello? I said, hello? You know, you, you, you don't, don't listen to people who, who want to. I mean, I was on television in Greensboro one time, and there was a pastor on there, and this woman called in. Well, this guy was hosting. He, he, he was an anti-word of faith pastor. I mean, he really was. He, he, go, he went to a, he pastored a church. I saw the guy in public one time at, at um, oh, um, Marshall's over there off of uh, Market Street. I said, hey, because I've been on the past, past with him a couple times. I said, hey, how you doing, brother? He turned his back on me, wouldn't talk to me. Kind of just said, hey, wouldn't even talk to me. I thought, dear Lord. <clears throat> I know you don't believe like I believe, but come on. You know? I'm like, good. Well, so this woman calls. She says, well, I send my tithe to this television preacher, and that tithe to this. And I, and I answer, I said, I'm so, I said I'm so, you need to tithe to your local church. And if you don't have one, you need to find one locally. You don't, the guy on television is not flying in to pray for you if you go to the hospital next week. Amen. The best you might get is some prayer counselor at their ministry. If you call in and say, I'm, I'm about to die, I'm having a heart attack, pray for me. You know, well, and they might pray for you out there. And you never get follow up. They go send nobody to the hospital, nothing. You know, he gets on there, oh, your heart is to give. No, 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 no. See, the, we, we get into this, how your heart is, and it's all about your heart. If your heart doesn't line up with what the Word says, it ain't right. Because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
In other words, do what he do, do it the way he said. Well, the only commandment is the commandment of you better just go back and read your Bible a little bit better. We we kind of take the phraseology that you know that John used and say that's the only commandment is to love one another. Now Jesus said all the law and the prophet hinge on that, but he didn't say that it's the only commandment. You know, in other words, love should be the motivating factor behind everything you do, your love for God and your love for your neighbor, but it's not the only stinking commandment. Amen. Excuse me, the only holy commandment. But people get off the, get off the deep end and it's the only, oh, just love. You feel like, you, I could see them in their hippie outfits with the flowers in their hair. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's just one thing the world has too little of. You know, we get a Coca-Cola and start singing with the, uh, you know, <laughs> like to teach the world. <laughs> Let's go hippie. <clears throat> no, love is, is behind um, everything, but it is not the only commandment. Okay? And so you know, we, we have to understand that faith works in the realm of where we believe it, we say it. There are other actions that are, in, that are required in things. Faith works by love, but you know what? You know, you still got to work the faith. And you got to keep it. And if you love the Lord, you'll keep his commands. You'll do it the way he said and do it. And if he said do it a certain way, that is, you know, I've had people tell me, you know, because I'm under grace, I'm going to prosper no matter what. Yet the Bible says that, you know, you would, in 2 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul, the preacher of grace, said, He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. And as a Georgia prophet said, <clears throat> I remember when I first got saved back in 79, there was a guy out of Georgia, he's called himself the Georgia prophet. He's on the radio. He says, some folks send $30 and some folks send $20 and some folks send 10 and some folks send nothing. As the scripture saith, nothing from a nothing leaveth a nothing. <laughs> it's on radio, man. He's preaching out on the radio. <laughs> I got my strongest concordance out. I couldn't find that scripture. <laughs> in other words, if you don't say nothing, you ain't going to get nothing. Well, there's truth in it, but the scripture didn't say it that way. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know? Yeah, send so, so in get your $5 worth of anointed salt. Throw it over your shoulder, turn around three times. You'll be, no, that don't work either. Okay? So anyway, um, there, there are certain keys, there are certain things you have to do to stay in line with the Word of God, but the number one way, and really you've got to start saying it, because it, what, what happens to the, um, with Joshua 1.8? This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you'll meditate and mutter. Therein day and night that you may what? Observe to do. Speaking it positions you to do it. Okay? If there's a, if there's a secondary or subordinate action required in it, you, you speaking it will position you to start doing it. That's why we need to speak it. If you don't say it, you won't do it. You're not going to do what you're not going to say. If you refuse to say it, you won't go do it. Okay, so so let's get back. So let's get into uh, say. Let's be speakers of the word. Let's be doers of the word. Let's be act on the word. Hallelujah! Lord have mercy. I'm gonna shoot that when I get home. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay with it until I find out what the password is. Hallelujah! Now, text message came. Text message came and took over my phone. Like. <laughs> Okay, so Jesus said, if you believe it and say it, okay, so you're, so saying it gets you so you can do it. Now let's look at, let's look at our uh, primary example tonight, the woman with the issue of blood, okay, um, Mark 5, Mark chapter 5, marvelous story, hallelujah. Verse, starting in verse 25. Now remember this story. Jairus has come to Jesus to get him come to heal his daughter who's home about to die. And Jesus is on the way. And um, it says here, and Jesus went with him. This is, that's Jairus. And much people followed him and what? Thronged him. 
I mean, they're just bumping all. You, you've been to, I mean, if you've been to Disney or the Carowinds or some theme park on a, on a really busy day, you can't hardly walk without getting bumped into. <clears throat> I mean, they're just knocking you all over the place. They're banging you, you know, just. And they're, all they're doing is it's a throng. There's so many people, there's no room to walk. And you're walking like this. Because you're going to step on somebody's foot. Okay, so what, what's that? Jesus is being what? Touched. Okay? Jesus is being touched. He's being touched by people all over the place. They're banging all into him. They're knocking him around. They're thronging him. Okay? And a certain woman, now there was this, this is not a parable. A certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years. In other words, she, had a, she was having a bloody discharge and suffered many things of many physicians, spent all that she had, nothing better, but rather grew worse. Now this woman had been going to doctor after doctor after doctor. And you know, in, um, you know, in medieval times, they, would, they did a lot of bloodletting. They'd cut you in this, because they thought, you know, getting the letting blood out would, would get rid of infection. And stuff. Get, doctors tried all kinds of crazy stuff, because they thought it would help. Didn't help. Sometimes they killed them just from anemia. Took all the blood out. This woman had been having this, this discharge, and she was considered unclean. Under Jewish law, for an unclean person to come in contact with no, other people or non-contagious people or other people in the society and not warn them ahead of time that they were unclean, they would have to go out in the street, and people were coming down the street, they had to stop and start crying, unclean, unclean, so that people could avoid them. That was required under law. And if they, found, if they didn't, they could be stoned. And the Jews were, were world-class stoners. Why? Because by stoning them, it made them better. Remember, uh, the woman caught an adultery in the very act. They were all brought her in before Jesus and ready to stone her. And now, uh, do, have you ever stopped to think about that story just a little bit? Where was the man? <laughs> if they caught her in the very act, it takes two to tango, baby. Yeah. Hello? I mean, she can't commit adultery by herself. <laughs> okay? There had to be the man. And, of course, uh, history th uh, uh, theorizes that it was one of the, one of the Sanhedrin, one of, one of the Pharisees, one of the uh, rulers. That's why they didn't bring him. Okay. And they were going to have a cover-up by killing her, protecting him. <laughs> have one of them days, huh? <laughs> Say have one of those kind of days. I'm just sitting here and I saw a dog. I don't think it was directly personal. I think it was generalized. No, it was personal. No, it was generalized. Okay. <laughs> good, good bunch of them today. Okay. Yeah. These good ones this week. These is perfect. These are my angels. Okay. They, they on the high ranking this week. Oh, you right. are her special angels. <laughs> okay, let's move right along. So anyway, <clears throat> they were ready to stone that woman. And then Jesus began to write on the ground. Of course, they, everybody says, well, you know, he's writing adultery. He's writing fornication. And then he says, he's without sin. Let him cast the first stone. And they all start dropping the rocks and walking off. Okay. They were world-class stoners. Okay, I don't mean I don't mean rolling stoners or, or bong stoners. They were they killing stoners. Okay, okay. Now listen to this. The Bible says when she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said. Now the Greek actually says this. For she said and kept on saying, If I may but touch his clothes. I shall be whole. Now she heard of Jesus. What did she hear? She apparently, see the only way she could have gotten this is she heard people touch his clothes and got healed. Right. Right. But it was a different kind of touch. He's being thronged. Amen. All the people being throng, thronging him are not getting healed. Right. Okay? How do you know? Well listen to this. Straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed in her plague, of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing himself that virtue, power, right. had gone out of him now, all the people touching him out of thronging or curiosity or whatever else, he didn't feel virtue going out of him. Why? No faith was in there. There wasn't a touch of faith to draw from the master what they had needed. They were just curiosity. It was like Elvis being at the concert. 
Oh, I touched them. I'm never going to wash my hands. Dear God, I hope so. It's going to stink after a while. Okay? You know, they, the, women get, did all that stuff, rock and roll people. They just, ah, ooh, and pass out. You know? Donnie, women. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, see. I got a laughing now. <laughs> She's biting her tongue. Phone, but I flew away from her. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus immediately knowing that virtue had gone out of him. Said, Who touched my clothes? He turned about in the press and said, Everybody's knocking up against me. He said, Who touched my clothes? Now and of course here comes the most spiritual guys on his ministry team. <laughs> And the disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me. Now let me say, let me put this in modern English for you. Master, everybody's touching you. Everybody's touching you. And he's, you got to think there was times Jesus just went, Really? <laughs> really, guys? <laughs> Wait, just shut up. You know, just don't say anything else. <laughs> then y'all won't have to rebuke you. Peter never learned it. Not until after the resurrection. Yeah. I mean, Jesus had to call him Satan one day. Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> he just didn't get it. Yeah. Who touched me? The disciple said, Thou seest a multitude throng on thee, and sayest thou who touched me? He looked round about to see her that had done this thing, and the woman, fearing and trembling, uh, knowing what was done to her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. What is she telling? I heard of you. And I, I'm laying on my bed. I'm anemic. But I, I said, if I can touch his clothes, I'll be whole. If I can touch his clothes, I'll be whole. If I touch his clothes, I'll be whole. She gets up out of that bed and goes out in the street. There's people walking in the street. You don't hear her crawling. She's not crying out unclean. She's saying, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. She gets to the street where Jesus is, and there's all this crowd around him, you know, all, all, all thronging up against him and everything. And what does she do? I, the only way she could get, really get to him is get down and crawl in. Now, that's supposition. We don't really have, uh, but that really it's the only way she could get to him. She got in there and touched, and as soon as she touched that garment, what happened? Because she was saying, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. What happened? She touched the, if I, actually, if I touch his garment, she kept saying that. And when she hit that garment, what happened? The point of contact. What she was saying, she was acting on. And when her hand touched that garment, Faith was released. We say you can say she was acting in faith all along, but it wasn't released to receive until they hit that garment. And the second it did, Jesus immediately knowing him, virtue went out of him. He felt the power flow out. <laughs> now I'll be honest, I've ministered, I've ministered under, under strong anointings before. And you can, I've had it, now not all the time, a lot of times you're ministering in accordance with being able to be hit to the lay hands on people and so forth. But I've actually felt the power go out of my hands. And I have felt it sometimes come back in. Because the person on the other side has got not, not hooking up with you. Right. And you try to instruct, now stop, stop, shut up, stop talking, stop talking. Calm down, now receive. Sometimes you can get it, sometimes you can't. They just, they just, I mean, I've, I mean, I've felt you go, go right in and come right back into you. Yeah. You're like... Okay, I got, and you try to spend some time with them and get them help. Some, and, and, and I would say more times than not, but you know, sometimes you, you just can't get them to do it. They, 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 their mind's somewhere else. They've got some other, something else in their mind. They think they understand it. They're, they're not listening to you. But I'm telling you, when you feel it go out, you know it went out of you. You could, and not always, no. Now, I'm not Jesus. And sometimes those manifestations are, are there, and sometimes you just, you're operating by faith. But I've had them where you actually touch people, and you feel the power flow out of you. And go into them. And you're like, <laughs> of course, when you're on one end, there, you're going, ooh, that was fun. <laughs> on the other end, you're thinking, thanking God they're getting what they need from heaven. Right. Well, when, if, if I can be a, that aware of something, how much more the Lord Jesus. And so when that woman touched him, that touch of faith, it released that power. And, it went, and the Bible says she immediately knew. That power went into her with such a surge and did such a work in her so fast, she felt she was healed of that plague. 
Well, how, a number of years ago, we had, we had a lady in the church, and, I, and I, I was ministering. I was in the Spirit, and I was ministering. And uh, I said, I said, someone here is so bound, you can't breathe. You can't breathe a deep breath. And she, she really is, uh, from what we, I could gather from her later afterwards, when she testified about it, was she's just got it prompted by the Lord, that's you. And she came out, laid hands on her, and the power of God knocked the daylights out of her. She got up and said, I didn't know I couldn't breathe until I could. The power of God set her so free. When she breathed, she realized, I couldn't breathe like this before. See, she was so bound up by, by uh, emotional and spiritual things that she couldn't take a deep breath. And when she got free, she knew it. And this happened this woman, she had had that issue of blood so long that when she didn't have it anymore, she could feel she didn't have it anymore. Because whatever symptoms were going along with it, it's gone. Hallelujah. So she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. <laughs> glory to God. I said glory to God. So all of a sudden she went from anemia and it probably felt lousy all the time. Yeah, she probably felt good. And all of a sudden, she knows it ain't there anymore. I mean, she's probably out there doing the Tulsa two-step. Which was, you know, they call it Tulsa two-step. It, it was kind of a Jewish little thing. You know, there was that time in the 70s, 80s, everything had to be Jewish beat and Jewish rhythm to be true worship. Y'all, anybody remember that time? Oh, yeah, yeah. You had, you had to get, get, get in the lines and... And then we speeded up. Well, we were really spiritual. That's, that's fine. Okay. I get it, you know, but, but you know, um, I grew up Pentecostal, and the Pente Pentecostal chicken is the order of the day. <laughs> I went to the only denomination you had to wear safety goggles when the women started dancing. Because they get to shaking that head and then bobby pins start going, bing, 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 bing. <laughs> hair come, that, that gray hair never been cut come falling down. Because it was a sin to cut your hair. Yeah. So, what happens here? She started saying something about what she believed. She heard of Jesus, and she said, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. She believed it. She started saying, and then she came out and went and did something about what she was saying. It started with believing, progressed to saying. You got to get it in your mouth. Let me say this. Tithing and not saying doesn't work. Hello? You need to speak over your tithe. That's right. You go back to the Old Testament. They had a confession they were to make at the tithe. Mm -hmm. Now, Lord, right. according to your holy commandment, and they would, they would, they would speak prosperity over their, over their money. Okay? And so saying goes along with it. Now, that was what I was trying to make earlier was it's not the only thing, but it start, you got to speak. That's why we pray over offerings. Mm -hmm. Amen. We've got to get, you know, get people speaking over things. Or agreeing with things spoken. Right. You know, anybody know what amen means? So be it. It, it is, a, it is a, an agree, term of agreement. I agree. It's not just what you say. You know, when the preacher says something you like. Amen. We had brother back in our church in Greenville. Brother George. We called him Brother Amen. He, he, was a, he, was a, he was a thin, he was about six, three, six, four African American gentleman with this deep voice. And he, you say something, he goes, Amen. And it would just resonate all over the whole room. We called him Brother Amen. <laughs> and finally, the pastor had talked to him when they said, Brother George, when I say the devil uh, kills and kills, steals, and destroys, Amen is not what you say. <laughs> so be it. <laughs> <clears throat> God delivers us or something, but you don't say amen. You know, that's the truth, or, or you know, but amen, not so be it. Amen. Hallelujah. So, the woman came because she heard, she believed, she spoke, and she acted. You know, she could have laid in that bed, yeah. saying, and died. If I could touch the hem of it, if I could touch his garment, I'll be whole. Sure. If I can touch his garment, I'll be whole. I'm telling you, if I get up out of this bed 
and I walk out the door and I see Jesus and I touch his garment, I shall be whole. She can lay in bed saying that and die. There's a lot of people who say, I believe Jesus is God's son, but they don't confess him as Lord. One of these days, me and my maker, we're going we're gonna to get together. We're going to work this thing out. I got a special deal when the maker, I had to tell me that one day. Me and the maker have made a special deal. No, you hadn't, buddy. He said the days of their salvation. You don't, you don't make a deal with the master. He don't cut deals. Hello. Repent. Hello. Today is a day. Harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. When they, when they withstood me. Amen. Hardened their hearts. And they all died in the wilderness. Because they didn't listen. Amen. So, if we're going to take our faith from having the fundamentals of faith, hearing the word, believing the word, getting the word in us, got faith to receive, praise God, we got it, we got it, we got it. You got to start doing something with all that. That's how you get it. Okay? Here's how you get money. But you know, you know there was a... Um, um, a couple of these kind of stories, but there was a woman in um, Chicago. An actual well, woman. There was a man, a man, street, street, homeless man. And he died on the streets. Died. Homeless. And when they took him into the, you know, to, to do whatever they do with homeless people, he had a belt. It was a money belt. And there was $25,000 in that money belt. He had the potential to go stay in a hotel. He had the potential to get some kind of housing, to get a bath, to get cleaned up, to whatever. But he had hoarded that money up in that belt. He had the potential to get off those streets. At any minute, he could have walked into a hotel or anything and said, I, you know, I want to pay for the next six months or whatever. You know? Well, at two hundred dollars a week, you know, he could have stayed in there for two and a half years at some of those places. He had what he needed, to, but he never used it. There was a woman in England, and uh, she had uh, been a servant to a very wealthy family. And of course, you know, England was really—if you just watch—if you ever watched *Downton Abbey*, I knew that I just finished watching. We got the video, so we got to see the whole series for this year. We already seen the end. <laughs> who, who hasn't seen the end yet? We know what happens. <laughs> but you know the, the, the servant class and they're not, they're not slave classes but the people who worked as butlers and you know all that kind of stuff it was a career to them and they took it very seriously well, this woman had been a servant in that sense to a very wealthy family and she's in she's, the doctor's come to, the call to come see her she's in her bed she's dying because she doesn't have enough food she didn't have enough money to keep the house warm all this kind of stuff that she had retired or whatever he looks up and over top of her bed it's something that's framed. He said, where did you get that? She said, well, my, my, uh, the master of the house that I worked at, he gave that to me, and I framed it. She couldn't read or write. It was a stock that was worth thousands upon thousands of dollars, and she framed it because she didn't know what it was. <laughs> she didn't know what it was and here she is starving in the cold and she's got enough money to live like a king off of this thing and sitting over top of her bed and we got a lot of Christians who pet their faith who brag about their faith who are excited about their faith and it's framed on the wall or it's in a money belt around their waist and they're not using it they go to all the faith seminars and they get their faith they buy the books on how to get faith. They buy the books about ever increasing faith. They buy the books about, you know, uh, this, that, that, whatever about your faith. And all those books are really, 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 really good. It's what I, I foundation my life's on. Dad Hagen's books are amazing. And he, he didn't stop there. He went on and told you how to use it. There's a lot of people who get there, and it's like this up here. For, uh, for the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. It's, a, it's, a, it's framed so pretty. Pretty, pretty, pretty. And we never use it. When your faith is not designed to be framed and be talked about how wonderful it is and to pet it and just be so excited you got it. Then my father had a mantra of life. You know, we, we, a lot of times we get a new car, we don't want to get mud in it. 
His was, if I can't use it, I ain't no need in having it. If I can't climb in there and put mud up, up to the wazoo's in there, out of hunting a deer, brand new truck, go, go through the woods, get scratches on it because I went there hunting a deer or whatever, you know, down the back road, I don't even want it. His son's the same way. He's got the truck. He's torn all the pieces. Anyway, Nathan's upset because Nathan wanted it. Nathan wanted his papa's truck. And, but, but his son got it. He has torn it all to pieces. And it, just, it just makes Nathan almost sick to his stomach. And I, and I use it figuratively because he wanted that truck because it was his papa's. And, um, you know, and he, he, it, Mitch has just taken that thing. And he has dogged it. Of course, Nathan would have babied it because it was his papa. He would, he would, he would, he would have made a shrine out of it. <laughs> you know, he would, he would have in memory of William Calvin on there or something. <clears throat> but your faith is not to be carried. Your faith is to be used. Your faith is a tool for victory. Your faith is how you live and overcome. So just getting it, it's not enough. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.